We are looking at section 3.6 today. We are solving inequalities. Today's focus will be on polynomial inequalities, and then tomorrow we will focus on the rational ones. Okay? So it'll be a similar process tomorrow, but the equation or inequality is going to be a little bit different. Okay? All right, so we have a few steps. We're going to go through them one at a time with this first example. So we are solving graphically. I want you to highlight this, circle it, do something. All right. We are solving these graphically for the first few examples, and then we are going to solve algebraically for the second two or three. All right. So our first step is to get a zero on one side. Our inequality statement says 2x squared plus x is greater than 15. If we move the 15 back over, we have 2x squared plus x minus 15 is greater than 0. Okay? Our next step in this process is to get the zeros of this. Okay? We need to find those zeros. And we can do that with factoring. We could do that with, in this case, it's quadratic. We could use the quadratic formula, completing the square, that type of thing. This one is factorable. So let's go ahead and use that method. So our 2x squared I split into 2x times x. The negative 15, how would we break that up? I heard 5 and 3. All right, where do you want the 5? With the 2? 5 here, 3 here? Okay. What signs if we want it to be a negative 15? Okay, we need one negative sign, one positive sign. All right, where do we want the negative? With the 5, positive 3 here gets multiplied by the 2 to make a positive 6. Okay. What are my zeros? Now, I know it says it has to be greater than zero, but we're going to, in our mind, we're going to pretend that there's a zero. It's just equal to zero, all right? We want to find those critical points. So what makes the first parenthesis equal to zero? Five halves, which would be 2.5, okay? And in the second one, if x is negative 3, we get a zero? All right. So we got one side equal to zero, and we found the zeros. Our next step is to plot those on a number line and sketch the graph using concepts of the leading coefficient test. All right. So let's start out with a number line. My key points were negative 3 and 2.5. I'm going to put dots there because that's where I'm equal to zero. Okay. Using the leading coefficient test, we're going to analyze our first term, which was a 2x squared, our leading term. What shape is a graph that starts out with a 2x squared? It's a parabola, okay? Does it open up or down? Up. So if I were to sketch a graph of this, I know I have to cross the x-axis at negative 3 and 2.5, and I know it has to open up. So is it reasonable to see something like this? Okay. For our purposes today, we don't care where that vertex is. We don't care how low it has to go, all right? All we care about is, am I above 0? or below zero in each of those sections. Okay? We're going to analyze the graph in comparison to f of x. So again, go back to our equation here. We are supposed to be greater than zero, yes? So that means I have to be positive. My y values have to be positive. And that happens in this section here and in this section here. Yes? Can I be equal to zero? No. So when I look at my picture, I can't actually be at these points, 
right? I'm getting really close to those, but I'm not going to use them, okay? What they are asking me to figure out is for what x values am I greater than 0, right? I'm trying to find the x's that make that true. So I'm looking at my number line, and I'm going to say that anything in this area, in that interval, will give me y values that are up here. Yes? And anything to the right of 2.5 is going to give me y values that I've shaded in red. Okay? So if I have to be in that red area, I can use anything here or anything here. Does that make sense? So my solution is everything from negative infinity up to negative 3, but I can't actually be at 0, so I'm going to use rounded bracket. I'm going to jump over all this stuff in the middle that gave me the green section of my graph that's in the negative area, and then I'm going to pick it up again after the 2.5. Okay? So we wrote our solution in interval notation. If they do ask you to graph it, we can sketch our graph just like we did in past chapters. We want rounded brackets and arrows going out. All right, so step one, get one side equal to zero. And figure out the zeros. Now, again, it's not equal to zero. It's greater than zero. But we're going to pretend in our mind that it's equal to zero to find those critical points. How would this factor? x minus 5, x plus 4. So my critical points, my zeros would be positive 5 and negative 4. We okay with that? All right. Let's sketch them on a graph, on a number line. Okay. Those are my critical points. We need to think about the shape of the graph using that leading coefficient test. Our first term is just a positive x squared. So its shape will be parabola that opens up. Okay. So again, we're picturing something like this. Okay. And it's asking for sections of my graph, intervals, where my answer will be greater than 0. So I want x values that when I plug them in, I will get an answer that's positive. Okay? So where on my picture does that happen? I need to be in this section here, right? Or this part. So in terms of my number line, my x is, I could be anything in here or anything out there. Can I be at negative 4 and positive 5? No, I have to get close to those. So my solution, negative infinity up to negative 4, jump over the middle stuff, and then pick it up after the 5. Okay, and again, if I have to graph that answer, we'd include that. Okay. Looking at our second example, we do need to get one side equal to zero. So I am going to bring both of these terms, the negative 2x I'm going to add to the other side, the one I'm going to subtract.
Is that factorable? If it's not factorable, what are my other options for solving it? What? Completing the square or quadratic formula? Completing the square would, requi would require that I divide out the 4, which is going to create some fractions and make it kind of messy. So let's go ahead and do the quadratic formula. x equals the opposite of b plus minus square root b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. All right, simplifying. We've got negative 2 plus minus all over an 8. Inside our square root piece, what do we end up with? 20. All right, square root of 20 is what? How could we break that down? 4 times 5, so we'd get 2 root 5. Okay, so negative 2 plus minus 2 root 5, all divided by 8. Could we divide everything by a 2? So we end up with our zeros being negative 1 plus minus root 5 divided by 4. Okay, now for our answer, we are going to use those exact values, all right? We're going to put it as negative 1 plus root 5 divided by 4. Negative 1 minus root 5 divided by 4. In terms of sketching our graph, it would be helpful to have a decimal approximation for those. So that half the room, you guys go through with the plus sign. You guys go through with the minus sign. All right, so our decimal approximations for this were negative 0.8 and positive 0.3. All right, so picturing a number line, we've got negative 0.8 and positive 0.3. We know we're hit zero at those two values. Looking at our original inequality, we have a 4x squared, right? So it's going to be a parabola that opens up again. All right, so sketching that, we know we have this kind of shape. And we are looking for where we are, this time, less than or equal to 0. So less than 0 means we're looking at negative section, right? But in this case, we can actually equal 0 as well. So in terms of my picture, I, can, I want this part, yes? The part where I'm below the x-axis, below my number line. I can actually be on these values as well because I can equal 0. So the interval that gives me that chunk of my graph would be all of this. Agree? All right. So my solution is going to be from the negative 0.8 to positive 0.3. But again, remember I said we were going to go back and put the exact expression down? So I'm going to go back and write it as negative 1 minus root 5 divided by 4 all the way to negative 1 plus root 5 divided by 4. And because I can equal 0, I'm going to include those two endpoints with squared brackets. Okay? And again, we could show that graphically if they wanted us to. Okay? Sometimes you'll be asked to show the, the graph of your solution, and sometimes you won't. Our last... Um, graphical approach to this. We have x cubed plus x squared has to be less than or equal to 4x plus 4. So I'm going to start out by getting everything to one side. Is this factorable? Okay, let's use a grouping technique. Take an x squared out of the first two. We have x plus 1 left. What do we take out of the second two? Take out a negative 4. We'd have an x plus 1 left. All right. Using that grouping technique, we have x squared minus 4 times x plus 1. And x squared minus 4 is actually a difference of squares. We can factor that again. All 
All right, so where are my zeros? Negative 2, 2, and negative 1. Okay, sketching those. Okay, using our leading coefficient test. We have a positive x cubed. What shape would our graph be for an x cubed? That's the twist. Okay. Does it start low and twist high? Or does it start high and twist low? Low to high? Right? We want it to be a positive sloping type thing, right? Like a positive sloping line? Would start low and go high? Okay. So, sketching it, we have something like this. Okay. We are asked where that polynomial will be less than or equal to zero. That means we can be at zero, okay? Or we can be less than that. We can be underneath it. So this part and this part. Yes? All right, so in terms of our number line, what x values give me those yellow y pieces? Over here, so negative infinity up to the negative 2. Can I include negative 2? Yes. Okay, then I have to skip over some stuff. Where do I pick it up again? Negative 1 up till a 2. Okay, and again, if you have to graph it, All right, so questions on solving graphically. The idea behind the graphical approach is you're picturing the shape of the graph, right? We're just sketching it using that number line. We don't have to worry about the exact y values. We know where we hit zero, and we should know the general shape of our graph, okay? The last piece that we're going to look at is solving them algebraically. It uses some of the same exact steps, but instead of graphing it, we're going to be testing some points in each interval. Okay? So, first step, get zero on one side. Second step, find those zeros, just like we did before. We have another one that is not factorable, so we're going to go ahead and use the quadratic formula. So, based on our quadratic formula, we're down to negative 6 plus minus 2 root 7 over 4. I could divide a 2 out of all of that. All right, let's go ahead and get some approximate decimals for that. Negative 3 plus root 7 divided by 2, negative 3 minus root 7 divided by 2. What do we end up with? Anybody? Negative 2.8. What's the other one? Okay. All right. So picturing our number line, we're going to plot our zeros again on our number line. Okay. But
But this time, instead of graphing it, we are going to test points in each interval. Okay? So what I mean by that is we are going to look at what happens on each side of our zeros. Okay? You have to pick a number in each of those little intervals. Doesn't matter what the number is. Okay? Our goal is just to figure out will that value give me a positive or negative answer? Okay? So for this particular one, I'm going to test negative 3, all right, which would be about there. I'm going to test something between a negative 2.8 and a negative 0.18. What would be a good choice? What's the number between those? Negative 1 or negative 2, either way, right? Those will work. All right, let's say we test negative 1. And then I need something to the right of negative 0.18. 0 would be an easy one. Okay? I'm going to test those three values. And again, I'm not concerned about the exact answer I get out. What I'm concerned about is whether it's positive or negative. Okay? So if we plug a negative 3 into our equation up here, what do we end up with? Negative 3 squared is 9. 9 times 2 is 18. 6 times negative 3 is negative 18. So now I have 18 minus 18. And then I'm adding a 1. Yes? End up with a 1. And that's a positive value. Okay? So when I tested negative 3, I got a positive answer out. Yes? I'm going to put a plus sign up here. That means everything to the left of my 0 at negative 2.8, everything to the left would give me some kind of positive answer. Okay? All right, testing something in between our zeros. We said we were going to try negative 1. So this time let's go through, put a negative 1 in for our x's. Negative 1 squared is 1 times 2 is 2. We have 2. 6 times negative 1 would be negative 6. What are we going to end up with? Negative 3. So we get a negative answer when we tested that negative 1. Okay? So I'm going to put a negative sign in between here. Okay? So these zeros are kind of my breaking points for my graph. Now I'm going to test 0. What do we end up with if I put a 0 in? We get a 1, so we get a positive answer again. Okay. All right. The question originally asked me to find where I am less than or equal to 0. That means I can be 0 or I can be negative. Yes? So looking at my number line, I can be 0 here and here, and we were negative in between. So everything in the middle of those zeros would give me negative values. So my solution is going to be everything from negative 2.8 to negative 0.18. Again, I'm going to go back to using my nice, messy, uh, irrational answer here. Negative 3 minus root 7 over 2 all the way up to negative 3 plus root 7 over 2. Can I include the endpoints? Yes, I can equal 0, so I'll include them. Okay. All right. So we looked at our original function. We said we had to be less than or equal to 0. And we wrote our solution in, in interval notation again. So the only difference between solving graphically and solving algebraically is that instead of sketching the picture, we test points. All right, I'm going to pause the recording. I'd like you guys to go ahead and do the first few steps of this next example. All right. Get one side equal to zero. Factoring using our grouping technique.
All right, factoring x squared minus 1 into x plus 1, x minus 1. So possible zeros here are, what do we have, negative 1, positive 1, and negative 3. So on your number line, you need a negative 3, a negative 1, and a positive 1. We know we hit 0 at those values. Okay? We have to test something in each interval. So I'm going to test, um, let's use negative 4, negative 2, 0, and 2. All right, so I'm picking a number in each of those little chunks. Now, remember I said that we don't really care what the exact y value is. So you can certainly plug those numbers back into this right, into your unfactored version, or we can plug them into our factored version. Now the nice thing about putting them in the factored version, it's a little easier to tell if each of those factors will come out positive or negative, okay? So if I try plugging in a negative 4 for my x's, okay? Remember, I don't care the exact number, I care whether it's positive or negative. What is negative 4 plus 1? Is that going to come out positive or negative? It's going to be a negative. Negative 4 minus 1 is negative. And negative 4 plus 3 is still negative. What happens when we multiply three negatives together? We get a negative result. Yes? So I know that in this section, I'm going to be negative. Okay? Testing the negative 2. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative. Negative 2 minus 1 is negative. And negative 2 plus 3 would be positive. And when I multiply a negative times a negative times a positive, it comes out positive. Okay? Testing 0. If I put 0 in, my first parenthesis here becomes a positive. Put a 0 in here, I end up with a negative. Put a 0 in here, I end up with a positive. What's a positive times a negative times a positive? Negative. So I'm back to being negative there. And if I try the 2, 2 plus 1 is positive. 2 minus 1 is positive. And 2 plus 3 is positive. If I multiply 3 positives, I end up with a positive result. Yes? Okay. So everything to the left of negative 3 is going to give me a negative answer. Everything in between negative 3 and negative 1 will give me a positive. Everything between negative 1 and positive 1 gives me a negative result. And anything to the right of 1 gives me a positive result. What were they asking me to find? I can be 0 or less than, right? Negative. So on my graph, I can be here or anything in that negative section. I can be here and anything in between because those are all negatives as well. All right, so let's write our solution. We have from negative infinity up to negative 3. Are we including endpoints? Yes. We jump over that little section and then we pick it up again from negative 1 to positive 1. Okay. So my graph would look like that. All right. We have one more to try. It's already equal to, or it's already has one side equal to zero. So factoring, this is one of those perfect square trinomials that factor into two identical factors. What does that mean in terms of my zeros? How many zeros am I going to have? 
one, right? Multiplicity two. Okay. So my zero would be one third. So in terms of my number line, all I know is that at one third, I'm going to hit the x axis. I'm going to be at a zero. So we're going to test a point on either side of that. So let's say we test zero and one. Okay. What happens if I put zero in? I end up with negative 1 and negative 1 for my two factors. So a negative times a negative is positive. Okay, so I'm positive here. If I test the 1, I have 3 times 1 minus 1. Positive 2. So I get two positives again. The question asked for me to find where I am negative, less than zero. But to the left of my one-third, I'm positive. At one-third, I'm exactly at zero. And to the right of one-third, I'm positive again. So is there any section in here where I end up with a negative value? Then I would say there's no solution. Okay, now. I want you to think graphically. I know that these last couple of examples we were solving algebraically, but if this was a test question, I would look at this and say, I have a positive x squared, right? That is a parabola that opens up. In terms of my graph, I'm looking at this, right? There's no place on that graph where I dip below the x-axis. How would my answer have changed if there was an equal sign as well as the less than zero. In other words, if there had been a less than or equal to zero instead, then one third would be my answer, right? There's only one value where I hit zero. Okay. All right. So in your homework, I have split it up. There are some that I'm asking you to solve graphically, and there are some that I'm asking you to solve algebraically. All right.